So we've got 30, 36, well, we've got 36 participants right now and the number is growing, but I'm going to just go ahead and start us off. Uh, so I'd like to start by saying a big hello and a big warm welcome to everybody joining from all around the world. It's, yeah, it's really exciting to see uh, where you're all joining from. Thanks for introducing yourselves in the chat. Um, so this is our second Capricorn webinar. We're excited to see your faces and see your messages. And I'm Phoebe Tickell. I'm the course development manager at Capricorn, uh, and I work together with Fritjof and Mira, um, Mira Michelle on the team to publicize the course and organize events and engagements such as this webinar. Uh, so this is a new series of webinars that we've started called the Capricorn webinars. Um, it's a series of live online conversations between Fritjof and friends and colleagues such as Terry um, about their work and life and we'll be running a series of these roughly monthly. Uh, last month we were lucky enough to be joined by systems thinking architect Stephen Bingler and the recording can be found on our Capricorn Vimeo page uh, which is just Cap Capricorn is the name of the Vimeo page and uh, this month I'm really excited that we're joined by Terry Irwin uh, researcher in transition design and head of school of design at Carnegie, I think it's Carnegie, Carnegie, not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, I'll leave that to Fritjof Mellon University uh, for what promises to be a really special conversation. I'm very excited to see where it goes. So before we start, I just wanted to introduce the platform that we're using uh, and how to use it in the context of this call and then also go through the schedule and then I will pass over to Fritjof. So Zoom is a video communication platform uh, and it's used for video conferencing and uh, we found it to be a really great platform. It's, it's great to be able to see all of your faces and um, have a conversation like this. And in, so in this context, Fritjof, Terry and I will be the only participants with access to microphones while everyone else has access to video and to the chat. Um, and that's important because after Fritjof's introduction and roughly 30 minutes after the conversation, we'll open up the floor for questions um, for Fritjof and Terry. And the way that you are able to ask questions is through the chat window. So if during the conversation, if you have a question or if something comes up, please write your questions into the chat and I will be collecting those and harvesting those and then choosing a selection um, when it comes to the Q&A. And if we have time, we might be able to take some live questions as well. Um, so I think that covers questions in Zoom. Um, so just to run through the schedule, we've got, we've just had a five minute intro and welcome from me. Then I will pass over to Fritjof. He's going to introduce the webinar and introduce Terry. Um, then rough, at a, roughly 9.15, uh, Fritjof and Terry will have their conversation. During that time, you're really welcome to send us your questions in the chat window and I will be collecting those throughout the conversation. Then at roughly 9.40 or 9.45, um, we'll move on to questions that I'll read out. And we have about 30 minutes for questions. And then we aim to finish by 10.15. So we'll be wrapping up a couple minutes before then. Um, lastly, before handing over to Fritjof, I just wanted to remind you that our full 2018 Capra course um, will be starting in just 25 days. And we're now half full of our 200 places on the course. Um, so it's not too late to join us and we'd love to see you there and as part of the alumni community you get to participate in all sorts of great events like this one and um, yeah and the course itself is is fantastic so um, yeah without further ado I will hand over to Fritjof and he will introduce Terry. Uh, let me find unmute Fritjof over to you. All right you. well thank you very much Phoebe for facilitating this again uh, maybe we should also uh, mention that uh, I'm here in Berkeley in my home office. Hello, everybody. And uh, Phoebe is currently in Mexico, as you can see from the lush vegetation around her. And uh, Terry is in Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh. So hello, Terry, and welcome to our Capricorn webinar. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, let me just briefly introduce you. Uh, as you heard already, uh, Terry is a uh, professor and head of design of the School of Design uh, in, uh, at Carnegie Mellon at uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. 
And uh, Terry and I are old friends. We met uh, over 15 years ago when she took a course of mine at Schumacher College. She was living in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time. And uh, since then, we have collaborated, we have inspired one another in many ways, and uh, we are good friends. So this is a real pleasure. Uh, Terry has been teaching design at various universities and other institutions of learning. And uh, so let me just start the conversation. So Terry, uh, you started out as a designer, you were working in design, I believe, with a company in San Francisco. And uh, my first question is, uh, what made you move from working in design to teaching design? And also, is that somehow related to your passion for eco-design, which you have championed at Carnegie Mellon and in various other places? Yeah, well, great question. Fritja, thank you for having me here. I'm really excited about the Capricorn platform and really flattered to be one of the first people contributing. Um, I guess the short answer is that I had been practicing design for a very long time, but I'd also been teaching design since 1986 at the university level. Uh, that was quite a balancing act to be running a company and teaching a couple of days a week, but I always was very committed to teaching. I was actually the founder and creative director of a San Francisco-based company called um, Meta Design, and we had offices in San Francisco, Berlin, London, and Zurich, and we were working on very big projects all around the world, Fortune 5,000 or 1,000 companies for a very long time. And there got to be a point for me, I'd already been designing for nearly 30 years, when I started to think about the larger social and environmental uh, ramifications of the things I was designing, and we designed products and communications and interfaces and software platforms. And I began to see the connection between the things I was designing and the large complex problems that we were facing in the world. And I think once you begin to see those connections, they cannot be unseen again. Um, I remember, you know, uh, another designer friend of mine told me once, this was many, many years ago, actually mm -hmm. when I worked on Leonardo da Vinci and, and tried to present Leonardo as, as sort of the father of design. And she said that uh, um, recognizing problems is an integral part of design. Yes. Yes, I think we sometimes drive people crazy because we're always looking for what's wrong and isn't working instead of what is working. Yeah. Um, it's natural that you, you were expanding your, your vision dealing with, with uh, you know, major global problems. That's exactly right. And I think it's something that perhaps naturally happens as you get older and as you gain more and more experience and even mastery in an area, your context starts to expand. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we can solve problems quickly and efficiently and profitably is usually because we draw such tight contexts around the problem. The minute those contexts start to expand to include social and environmental issues, every problem becomes complex. And then it's not so easy to solve them quickly and profitably. Mm. Now, as I was running the company and working on these very large, interesting problems, and I think doing very good work from a traditional point of view, I was also teaching design at CCA in San Francisco. But as I became more and more conflicted about the work I was doing, I saw the huge contradiction <laughs> in the fact that I was teaching new generations of designers to do the very same thing I was conflicted about. California College of Arts, maybe for those. That's, oh yes, that's right. Who don't know. Yeah, I taught there for 17 years. But um, I should also say that all of this coincided very neatly with a midlife crisis. And uh, I now believe that midlife crises can be very productive things if you, if you treat them with respect. So I, at a certain point, thought I'm either going to have to find a new, more responsible and appropriate way to design, or maybe in the second half of my life, I'll just run off and join the Peace Corps 
and do something that is more connected to solving and making problem or resolving problems and making the world a better place instead of exacerbating them, which was what I'd come to believe that the way I was designing was doing. So I ended up leaving my company and I think the first step on the journey to where I am today began um, with a course I took with you at Schumacher College. It was a three week course. Um, and once I was there, I uh, discovered that they offered a degree in something called holistic science. And I applied and got in and sold almost everything I owned and moved to Devon, England to do this course. So once there, my focus was really on studying living systems trying to understand what the principles and dynamics were in living systems and trying to propose that a better understanding of those dynamics could actually transform design process and design to be more appropriate and responsible. And, and you were lucky, you were fortunate to study with Brian Goodwin, who was one of the great pioneers of systems thinking, complexity theory, and, and all kinds yes. of other fields. Yes, he was, for both of us, I think, a, a dear friend and huge inspiration. And I still think about him every single day. What I learned from him was extraordinary, and it utterly changed the way that I think about design. Mm -hmm. um, so while you were taking the Schumacher course, you, you already tried to apply uh, what I now call the systems view of life to, to design. Is that correct? That's exactly right. So... We had to write a fairly lengthy thesis, master's thesis. Mine was 80,000 words. Mm. And it was actually on how principles from living systems could influence uh, more responsible design process. So yeah, that was really, that must have been in about 2004. So I really was digging into that. Mm -hmm. In 2007, I had the opportunity to move to Scotland and begin doing uh, doctoral studies there. And what I wanted to look at there was how to connect what I was learning to um, design curricula. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's great to hear. I didn't know every, every part of that story. Now, I wanted to ask you something. I don't know whether you remember many, many years ago, uh, you told me you made a very interesting comment that stayed with me. Uh, you said that uh, the problem with eco-design is that most designers know very little about ecology and mm -hmm. then most eco-activists who call themselves eco-designers know very little about the principles and practice of design. And so I remember when you started at Carnegie Mellon, you told me that one of your goals was to bridge this gap. And, and so does this gap still exist? And, and what have you done in the meantime to bridge it? Yeah. Well, I think, yes, the gap still exists. And I, as it does between most disciplines, most fields and disciplines, I think because of the way our universities and entire educational system is structured, you know, knowledge is siloed and we're encouraged to be specialists and experts, which means you go deep and you don't go broad. Um, I think whereas designers are educated in form giving, problem solving, and we usually have a pretty good understanding of user psychology and the way in which they operate in what I will call ecologies of project products and environments and interactions of all kinds, um, we don't study ecology or earth system science. And then conversely, ecological designers, I think, often come from fields like biology or engineering or even permaculture. So they have a deep um, appreciation and understanding of principles like symbiosis and how earth systems work. But I don't think they're as versed in making things useful and beautiful as we are, although they may be in harmony more in harmony with nature, but I think they often focus on more technological solutions. So I've come since that conversation you and I had so long ago to believe that perhaps the problem is it's not a question of how to teach designers ecology 
or ecological designers more about design. I think the world still needs uh, experts and specialists. I think it may be more about how do we get people from complementary disciplines to collaborate on the type of complex problems that you wrote about, um, for instance, in the turning point. And the design disciplines have referred to these problems as wicked problems. Mm -hmm. And they're characterized by multiple stakeholders with conflicting agendas. These problems exist at multiple levels of scale and there's never a single solution. So these problems, most importantly, cross disciplinary divides. Mm -hmm. So they require transdisciplinary approaches and radical collaboration, which I don't think most education prepares us for. Mm. Yeah, so that, what I call systemic problems. Yes. Right? That, that exactly. reach into, into different systems levels and yep. uh, different areas. Yeah, it's exactly the same. So, so what do we do about that? Or what have you done about it? Well, I think that we collectively need to begin to develop a different educational paradigm, one that is doesn't separate the disciplines into silos, mm. and one that perhaps moves to more collaborative project-based education, as opposed to mastering knowledge that is handed down from one generation to another and, and goes deep. Mm. Um, one of the things that we've been thinking about in our curricula is how to create T-shaped people. So if the vertical stroke of the T represents the depth of your expertise mm -hmm. and the crossbar represents the breadth of your abilities, mm -hmm. that crossbar of the T is where you can begin to collaborate with other disciplines. So that requires new mindsets and postures mm -hmm. and an ability, I think, to not speak in highly specialized vocabularies that are, that are characteristic of your particular discipline. So we've begun to introduce this kind of hybridity into our undergraduate uh, program to try and create designers who can easily collaborate with folks from complementary disciplines. That's one thing. Well, you know, this uh, years ago when I first uh, thought about creating an online course, this mm -hmm. was one of my main motivations. To, to have a general course for undergraduates who oh. want to do no matter what, because most of the areas we deal with in our personal and professional lives have to do with life. With Absolutely. Systems, with individual organisms, uh, ecosystems, social systems. So whether we talk about economics or healthcare, education, social justice, design, it's all about life of various... Absolutely. And so to, to deal with this. Now, Terry, more, more recently, you and, and Gideon Kossoff created a new discipline called transition design. And I'm very curious to hear more about that. Um, what what is it and and uh, why do we need it? Why not just eco design? What's what's new? What have you added or? Yeah, great. Just tell us a little bit, please. Great questions. Yes, it, it's actually a an area of design focus that Gideon proposed for the first time in his 2011 doctoral thesis in design, mm -hmm. and then he <clears throat> excuse me. Gideon, Cameron Tonkinwise, and I worked together at Carnegie Mellon to actually integrate it into our programs, and we created a PhD in, in the topic. But it was in direct response to a lot of these concerns that I mentioned before, and it attempts to create a transdisciplinary area of design focus that can be aimed at both addressing complex, wicked problems but also finding ways to shift entire societies and communities towards more um, sustainable futures. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it differs in, from ecological design in its radically systems level approach. I think the term eco-design was coined by Sim Vanderen and Stuart Cowan. Mm -hmm. And I looked up the definition online and it said, 
It's often defined as any form of design that minimizes environmentally destructive impacts by integrating itself with living processes. Ecological design is an integrative, ecologically responsible design discipline. So I think in that way, it shares its uh, goals with transition design in that it advocates enmeshing processes with the environment in symbiotic, restorative ways. Mm. Um, and I think it's a broad area that encompasses a myriad of different approaches. But I think it often is undertaken in a project by project basis and not always, but often focuses on technological or designed solutions. Mm -hmm. In contrast, transition design very intentionally looks at how our large socio-technical systems have developed historically and how they have become unsustainable and entrenched. And of course, part of the way that they become entrenched is that these wicked complex problems are embedded within them. So from a systems point of view, transition design tries to take into consideration both spatial and temporal uh, aspects of the way our systems became the way that they are. How did they develop historically? How can we think about the trajectories they're currently on and how to shift them? But how these problems and the unsustainability manifest at multiple levels of scale. So it argues that the wicked problems confronting us that we're well uh, acquainted with, like terrorism, poverty, the growing gap between rich and poor, or North and South, are systems problems in themselves. And so they behave according to a lot of the principles that we see in systems. They entrench and make intractable the large systems we're embedded within. So some of the solutions that transition design would advocate, and we refer to them as systems interventions, might be technological. But we very much argue after you, when you proposed in the turning point, that our main crisis is a crisis of perception, mm -hmm. or the results of an outmoded worldview that's inadequate for understanding and coping with an interconnected, interdependent world. Transition design also attempts to understand how worldviews, cultural norms, and collective behaviors contribute to the problems in these large systems and actually are the connective tissue that hold them together. So although some interventions might be technological, transition design also looks at, at the top level, large, broad cultural trends and norms, but at a granular level, how our everyday actions and behaviors also contribute to the stuckness of these systems. So you, you place yourself really uh, within this uh, fairly large community of uh, uh, historians, scientists, social critics, eco-activists. Uh, I mean, the, the people who are on the faculty at Schumacher College, for instance. Yes. You know, people like Vandana Shiva, Hazel yes. Henderson, David Orr, and, and who are our colleagues and mentors. So yes. you give this a design focus somehow. Yes. Uh, in fact, we developed a framework for transition design that intentionally mm -hmm. seeks to integrate knowledge from outside the design disciplines. And I should say that we call it design because of its intentionality not because we think expert designers will be the ones doing this work. Uh -huh. We think that designers have a role to play, not only in working alongside people from other disciplines, but we also think there's a role for us to play in developing tools and approaches that have to do with materiality mm -hmm. and creating solutions. But intentionally beginning to shift the trajectories of our society's transitions mm -hmm. makes it design. Yeah. Herbert Simon, the famous Nobel Prize uh, economist and planner who was actually from Carnegie Mellon, defined design as changing existing situations into preferred ones. And in that regard, we're all designing all the time. 
So designing for transitions is actually what transition design is about and will absolutely require the knowledge and approaches from myriad different fields and disciplines to be brought together to undertake, I think, this, this yeah. big task. Now, Terry, when you say designing for transitions, uh, that immediately reminds me of the Transition Town movement, mm -hmm. which is uh, a movement uh, that aims to create a future free of fossil fuels, and it does so by uh, sustaining local communities, mm -hmm. and by developing all kinds of collaborative projects. So I, I assume you would call much of that work design work, so, so what's the relationship between transition design and the transition town movement, both conceptual and in terms of uh, practical organizing yeah. relationships? Yeah, great question. Well, Gideon and I were living in Totnes, uh, which is the town where Schumacher is located, as you know, when Rob Hopkins, the founder of the transition design movement, held the very first transition town meeting there. And we, attend, we attended it. Yeah, I see. So we got to watch the, the flourishing of that movement right from its very first moment. So I think that really embedded the idea of transition into us very deeply. Yes. But we also have been watching the many other transition-oriented movements that are springing up around the world. In fact, we believe that transition has actually become a meme. You've got the Just Transitions movement, you have the Commons Transitions, you have the Socio-Technical Transition Network, uh, and then you have systems change uh, initiatives like Jonathan Porritt's Forum for the Future Systems School. Yeah. So we have been looking at all of these, and in fact, just this past summer, we organized a symposium called Transition Together at Dartington, which brought together representatives from all these transition-related initiatives. Yeah. And but hope I've always liked the term transition. I think it's, it's very profound and very ingenious for the reason that um, if we have a systemic outlook and if we realize that our major problems are really all interconnected, then, uh, and, and if we aim for sustainability, you know, mm -hmm. logical sustainability, then we have to realize that no individual can lead a sustainable life, no yeah. organization, no community can be fully sustainable because we're all interconnected with, with, with other things. Yes. However, what we can do is to move toward a state of ecological sustainability. And I think that's the, the ingenious thing about the concept of transition. I agree. Two important things for me is it's a verb. It implies that we are moving towards something yes. and that it's never really finished. And I think developing mindsets and postures that are comfortable with change and the idea of moving towards a desirable long-term future is really important. And transition design, one of the key components of that is that it advocates the co-creation of long-term desirable visions of the future with the stakeholders themselves. And when you backcast from those visions, it creates a transition pathway, which can guide the creation of projects and initiatives in the present. So I love this idea that there's no there there. Yeah. You're always trying to get to a better place. Um, I, I have to tell you something, to interject something. Uh, in the last two weeks, I just read a manuscript of a new book by our great friend and mentor, Satish Kumar, the oh, yeah. founder of Schumacher College. And the book is called Elegant Simplicity. Oh. And I wrote a foreword to it. Uh -huh. And uh, Satish says in this book, that elegant, first he describes what simplicity is, what elegant simplicity is, how it's related mm -hmm. to spirituality, how it's related to sustainability. It's a really beautiful book. Nice. And uh, then he says, well, how do we get there? And he says, it is a process. Is it a continual process? And in typical Satish fashion, he says, there's no destination. 
and it is a pilgrimage. Yeah. No? So what that is very Satish. If you take it to a deeper spiritual level, that's what you can say. There's no destination and it's a pilgrimage. Absolutely. And that's a really nice opportunity to also say that for us, there's a mindset and posture component to transition design in which it it argues that it's about inner transition as well. It's about looking at your own value set and how you yourself mm -hmm. may need to transition to do this work. And mm -hmm. for me, it's a, as much about this self-reflective process of intentional change as it is about solving problems in the outside world. So when did you start this transition design? Well, Gideon proposed it in his thesis in 2011. I arrived at Carnegie Mellon in 20, 2009, and we began immediately redesigning curricula to place these ideas at the heart of everything, and we launched those new curricula in 2014, along with a doctoral program in transition design. So this past May, we just graduated our first undergrads who'd been all the way, went all the way through the... the and new there program. are other universities, you say, who also teach transition design. Yes, from the very beginning, we have tried to share everything we've done because mm -hmm. we thought no small group of people, no single community, no single culture will ever be able to develop an approach because everything must be place-based and yet cosmopolitan in its sharing of information. Mm -hmm. So we put all of our syllabi, everything we, we wrote up as open source. And in fact, our transition design seminar syllabus is up online as a website. So because I think we didn't try to own it, we didn't want to make it proprietary, we said what we want to do is start a conversation mm -hmm. about the need for a new area of design focus people began joining in the conversation. And so now everyone in the, in the informal network is either integrating it into coursework or running courses in it or research strands in it. And, and I think by the end of the year, we'll have even more. Do you offer degrees? Do you have a master's in transition design or PhD? Not yet, not yet. We intentionally started at the doctoral level because we thought we want to get more researchers covering a territory so that we can begin to articulate what it is and what it is not. Mm -hmm. um, I think within a couple of years, we will move it into master's education. And we're actually talking to Schumacher College right now about the possibility of sharing it. And I know Cameron, our, Cameron Tonkinwise, our collaborator, who's now at the University of Technology in Sydney, is also thinking about starting a master's mm -hmm. program. And do you have a professional association of transition designers or anything like that? <laughs> no, we think it's too soon. I mean, I actually, in my notes to you said, you know, something like this begins uh, to pique people's interest and immediately our old paradigmatic thinking asks questions like this. What is it? Where's the process? Where's the recipe? How can I do it? Where are the case studies? Oh my God, and, I asked an old paradigm question. I'm sorry. sorry. No, it's a, it's a really good question, and I'm glad you asked it because it gives me the opportunity to say, I think this has to grow organically. Mm -hmm. And we intentionally say it's not a process. We say we're integrating knowledge that we think is very useful in seeding and catalyzing systems level change, and we're bringing together different tools that can be reconfigured in place and situation specific ways but I think we're a few years away from being able to call it something like that yeah. I think we have now reached critical mass we have enough folks around the world interested that we're thinking about hosting a gathering next summer at Darlington to ask questions like Mm -hmm. Should we have a network? And if we do, what should it be? What could it be? Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be defined by Carnegie Mellon. It should be all of us coming together. And the other key thing is we've needed, we've been missing some key cultural perspectives. I've been saying for a long time, mm -hmm. we need a voice from Central Africa. We need um, voices, more voices from the Southern Hemisphere. We need a voice from, voices from India. I think we've now got someone from Kenya 
So I've been reluctant to bring too much formality and form to it until we have more cultural diversity in the mix. Well, I had a, my, I had my sort of last question prepared, which was, uh, you know, what is your dream? What is your vision for the future? But just hearing you, I think it's yeah. not quite appropriate because <laughs> uh, if you say it should grow organically, mm -hmm. then, you know, it doesn't depend on the vision of Terry Irving. You That's know? right. That's, uh, it's, uh, so, so the vision would be to facilitate that organic growth, I guess. And that, yes. of course, is what you're doing. I understand you, you have been holding a number of gatherings already to, mm -hmm. to just discuss the various uh, parts of transition design. Yeah, for the past four summers, we've taught uh, short courses, twice at Schumacher, uh, once in Mallorca, once at Carnegie Mellon. I think we might be back at Schumacher next summer. So what that does is it enables us to come in contact with not only academics, but practitioners. And we think that practitioners will play a key role in this work. I think that there are certain things that only practitioners can do, and there are certain things that academics can do and researchers can do because they move at different paces. Uh -huh. But I think we, as yet, design has not done a good job of building bridges between those two populations, and I really hope that we can start in this work to find real symbiotic relationships between yeah. practice Maybe, and Terry, you could come back to uh, what you mentioned before, that you have a conceptual framework for transition design. Mm -hmm. Let's say a little bit more, because I think it will be more understandable if you, if you go into a little more detail. Yes, uh, we developed a transition design framework that I'm sorry, I don't have to hand at the moment. It, it simply has four areas. Uh, we say that vision must play a very important role in transitioning to a sustainable future because if we don't have a vision of where we want to go, we obviously yeah. will never get yeah. there. We believe that we need to be more explicit about our theories of change, which are always implicit in the way we design, but they're never overtly stated. Mm -hmm. So that's the area in which we're really bringing together lots of knowledge from other disciplines. Mm -hmm. We say that mindset and posture is absolutely critical. We are unabashedly about a values-based curriculum and a values-based approach, mm -hmm. but it's about self-reflection and transformation as well as external. And then finally, we say that new ways of designing will emerge out of all of the three. So what that framework has done and we hold it very lightly it's not a process it's not a thing to hang on to with both fists mm -hmm. it's allowed us to develop a pedagogy and a methodology for teaching it and that can hopefully guide projects and research mm -hmm. um, and so far we've been working with it for about four years so far it's been useful in that regard mm -hmm. now when i think of these uh, four areas uh, I'm especially intrigued by uh, theory of change. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'm asked that question about uh, theories of change, I usually refer to the systemic process of emergence where mm -hmm. every living system occasionally encounters a point of instability. Yeah. And out of that instability emerges spontaneously emerges a new form of order, new form of behavior, and so on. Do you use that uh, uh, concept of emergence? All the time. I, I mean, living systems principles are pretty fundamental to what we do mm -hmm. um, in transition design. Oh, that the funding community would get on board with that idea. Because mm -hmm. as you know, uh, I think yeah. the term theory of change was popularized by the funders. You know, they want mm -hmm. people applying for money to state explicitly what they think the theory of change is. And I think that's useful. But when you predict and pre-specify exactly what's going to happen in a linear way, we all know that yeah. life doesn't work that way. And in a way, that's the problem with design processes that are linear and cause and effect. We're not designing for emergence. We're designing based upon our prediction of exactly what will happen when we impose something on a complex system. 
I remember uh, years ago, 20, 25 years ago, when I co-founded the Center for Eco-Literacy, mm -hmm. I uh, had an interview with the director of a major foundation here in, in San Francisco. Yeah. And I told him about the project and, and he said, well, Fritjof, if you tell me that you want to build a playground and you can show that the playground by occupying children, you know, decreases the crime rate, you know, I, I, I give you $50,000. But yeah. if you say you want to gather people around to discuss new ways of education, I cannot fund that. You know? Yeah, I know. And the whole world is funded this way. And we often say that transition design resembles uh, Chinese acupuncture. Uh -huh. So you need to study a system and all of its complexities. You make an intervention and then you have to stand back and wait yeah. to see what the response is before you know where else to intervene. Yeah. And that Actually, goes against everything. Yeah, that we, Henry Lovins also uses that metaphor of yeah. acupuncture points. Yeah. Well, Terry, are you, are you ready for questions? Yeah, I'm sure. sure whether we have questions. Phoebe, do we have uh, questions that came in in the chat box? Absolutely, yeah. We've had lots and lots of questions. Oh, great. I can draw them up. Uh, thanks for a really... Yeah, I, I was hesitant to interrupt to move on to questions. <laughs> it's so interesting. Um, right, so questions the first question we got asked is a is kind of like a, a dive into the deep end um so i'm going to go ahead and ask it one of the most wicked problems of our time is humanistic design of machine learning and artificial intelligence design of that which cannot be immediately touched nor seen how can we as designers give form to ai designed with a respect for life i think that's aimed at terry yeah, and that question is certainly top of mind if you're at Carnegie Mellon University, um, one of the technology capitals of the world. So we have a lot of that going on at Carnegie Mellon. And I think, you know, some of it, I believe, is about always asking questions like how much is too much technology, um, simply because, as David Orr would say, it's possible doesn't mean it's always viable. And again, we are situated in universities in which ethics and philosophical questions like that are on one side of the campus and the technology that's being worked on is on the other. So it always comes back to integration, doesn't it? Um, I just read a really interesting essay I believe it was on Medium, about these very questions in AI. And it was written by a brilliant uh, scholar at MIT, a communication scholar named uh, Sasha Constanza Chuck, I believe it's C-H-O-C-K. And uh, Sa Sasha is transgender. And this, this uh, essay is looking at how our uh, prejudices are actually hard, hardwired into the technology interfaces that we design, and this could be applied to practically anything. And the example she cites is her repeated experience as a transgender person going through airport security. And the interfaces that are operated by the TSA agents literally either have a pink button or a blue button. So they see a person coming towards them and they push one or the other. If the pink button is pushed, then any anomaly in the groin area is gonna, is gonna flag up uh, something that's a problem. If the blue button is pushed, any anomaly in this area is gonna flag up. So Sasha gets stopped no matter what. And she makes a brilliant argument about intersectionality where different prejudices come, come together. But I don't think we are thinking deeply enough about how all of the worldviews, uh, prejudices, implicit bias finds its way into all of these products. And I think that I have to admit that this is only something I've become aware of in a deep way recently largely because Sasha put it on my radar screen. And what I've been doing is a lot of reading in this area. 
So I can't respond other than to say yes is a huge issue. And I think this is why the humanities exist, you know, to hopefully interject some of these fundamental questions in our headlong rush to develop technology in any way that seems possible. Let me add something, uh, Terry, and uh, address this to the questioner. I recently uh, read a very interesting essay, and I just looked it up, by an author called Ben Medlock. Mm. And it's called The Body is the Missing Link for Truly Intelligent Machines. It's, oh, a, it's a critical assessment of uh, uh, AI um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really, really uh, very, very profound. And uh, Phoebe, I think we can make this available, right? I can send the link to you maybe and, and yeah. You post it then on the appropriate Great. place. Yeah, absolutely. I was I was really inspired by it. Ben Medlock, the body is the missing link for truth. Good. Get that. Yeah, it would be great for us to be harvesting. Somebody's just posted the article that you mentioned by Sasha Constanza Chuck, so we can collect those um, resources and send them out. Um, I'd love to move on to a question that grounds things a little bit more in the practical side of things which is somebody's asking for a specific example of a transition design project. So maybe something that you've worked on recently, or maybe it'd be great to hear like a success story and a story where things you know, were difficult, or like a challenge. Yeah, well, that is a perfectly logical question. I get it every time and it's, and it's similar to where's the case study. And um, I know this is gonna sound like an apology, but we have been trying to constitute a new area of design focus. So we first began writing about it and um, pulling ideas in and talking to students and researchers about it. And we've always known that we need to land a project or two or three. Now, we've just started working with a community of Ojai, California. We began a couple of years ago. Um, they brought us in to ask whether transition design might be an approach to help them deal with their water shortage. After the Thomas fires, which some of you might have been aware of in December, uh, we quickly realized, both we all quickly realized, that it was actually going to be a project to transition Ojai to climate resiliency, not simply water security. So Transition design projects are going to be very long lived. They're going to last for years or decades in some cases. So you will have intervention points that you can begin to document and write about. But I think we even perhaps need to do away with the term case study because if you're transitioning, it's never over. What you can do is be writing and disseminating the learning, what's working and not working, and that we intend to do. But we're right now in a fundraising stage to fund several points of intervention, and it's taken two years, I would say, to build trust, to get to a point where we could get a memorandum of understanding signed with the city of Ojai, and I'm hoping that within another four or five months, we'll have raised money to do that. Now, there's another person I want to put on everybody's radar screen, and her name is Cheryl Dahl, D-A-H-L-E. And she was the founder and CEO of a nonprofit called Future of Fish. And Cheryl is one of the only people I've run across who I would say has been doing transition design for about a decade. And she was systematically working on the global problem of overfishing. Multiple intervention points all over the world, all the way from when the fish is pulled out of the sea and the local fishermen and their practices that make it sustainable or unsustainable, all the way to the point where the fish lands on your plate and a restaurant has cooked it and before them it's been, it's been uh, distributed and sold. So I'd encourage you all to take a look at Future of Fish. So Cheryl is now um, teaching at Carnegie Mellon. She's an adjunct professor on our faculty, and she is one of the people, she is like the point person on the OHI project. 
Uh, we're well, also, I'm, go I'm ahead. I'm very amused by this because uh, yesterday I was wearing a jacket that I hadn't worn in a while and in my uh -huh. pocket was a little paper saying the future of fish. And I thought, what the hell is that? So that must have been from me when we had lunch and I wrote it down. So That's that really funny. Yeah, so I think that our challenge is everybody wants examples and success stories. And if they were out there, I don't think there'd be a need for transition design. So it challenges us to figure out how we can be writing and disseminating information and learning in the moment without having to follow the old paradigm in which something is finished, done and dusted, and then you can measure its success. And this too is part of what we're figuring out. So it's like the proverbial ship of thieves where you're building it or rebuilding it as it's under sale. And I know that that's not a satisfying answer, and it's something we're grappling with ourselves right now. I think it's a, yeah, I think it, it might not be the answer that perhaps people are waiting for, but I think it, it demonstrates, yeah, really deeply demonstrates what transition design is about. I think it was a good question, and yeah, I agree with that answer. Um, just having a look, we've got a lot of questions, we won't be able to get through them all, so I have the problem of having to choose. <laughs> um, right. Are there any transition designers currently looking at how to reshape education systems, apart from obviously yourself? Uh, if so, can you summarize some insights gained around this? I don't know of anybody explicitly taking that on as a transition design problem. I do know there are plenty of people around the world that are grappling with the problem of all of us being embedded in a 19th century educational model, which uh, is as much about infrastructure that is just in place and intractable as anything else. Our thinking is always so far out beyond the physical infrastructures that we're embedded within. Um, I don't know if anyone has run across what I think is a really excellent book by Marcus Ford called Beyond the Modern University. And that was a really important book for me. It's very thin. He was formerly at Fox Chapel, and I'm not sure where he is now. I've been trying to track him down for years. But he talks about how the university is one of the longest lived uh, social structures on the planet, aside from the church, and the way in which it's reinvented itself several times. Uh, first as, as an instrument of religion, then as an instrument of the state. Uh, and now he's sort of arguing that it's an instrument of, of corporations. But he believes it's well positioned to reinvent itself yet again to be like an ecological university, a university that actually helps catalyze and see change. With respect to transition design, I would say in a small way, any of the people who have taken it up and are trying to introduce it in their institutions are to an extent challenging, trying to challenge existing educational paradigms. But I have not heard of anybody who is actually trying to reinvent one. If you hear of one, I'd love to know about it. We were very fortunate at Carnegie Mellon. It's a private university. It's a very grassroots, bottom-up kind of place. And I was able to run uh, a process in which the faculty came together and redesigned all of the programs and curricula at once. Now, we couldn't, we couldn't completely reinvent them, but we were able, I would say, to embed social and environmental concerns pretty much throughout, and we were able to do it quickly. I don't know how we completely reinvent it, and a phrase that Fritschhoff, I first heard Fritschhoff use many, many years ago in a lecture somewhere in Berkeley. He said, the Stone Age didn't end because they ran out of stones, they just found something better. So I'm, off, I'm often thinking that probably places like Schumacher College or Vandana Shiva's uh, organization in India may be the buds and shoots of something new that will eventually take hold. I'm not sure we're going to do it from within a uh, structure like mine. Hmm. Yeah, Schumacher is definitely taking steps towards that. Um, it's yeah. definitely very difficult to break out of the traditional 
lecture essay format. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to take a total rethink. But this is a step in the right direction. I mean, courses like this, and as the technology improves, as we're able to truly be with each other in remote locations across the, the planet, a, a kind of magic happens, I think, when you get people from diverse perspectives together. We had people from 10 different countries on our, on our short course at Schumacher this summer. And the Slack channel is just buzzing all the time. And I'm fairly sure some of those students are probably on this, pod, this, uh, this cast right now. And I'm so excited about how this medium is going to move on, I think, in the next five years and what it's going to make possible. Yeah. You know, in, in the Capra course, we now have uh, alumni from uh, over 50 countries. Amazing. And in every course, we, we have about 25 to 30 countries, really, really around Amazing. the world. Yeah. I mean, that right there is going to do more to transition us towards a new place because I would characterize one of our big problems, not just here in the United States, although boy, have we got it, is fear of other. Fear of other is just driving our political systems and so many... Uh, bad decisions right now. And I think more forums like this, more interaction between people from diverse cultures, diverse perspectives is, is one of the approaches we need to dial up. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a particularly powerful aspect of the Capra course is, you know, we mm -hmm. start with an online 12 week online course. And then after that, you know, that enables this network of practitioners yeah. to practically self organize. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, moving from education to this, the crisis of perception. So you mentioned um, that Fritschoff in his, in his book, Turning, The Turning Point, talks about this crisis of perception. Um, and the question is, how, how can we actually change something that's so intangible as, you know, as perception through design, which often shows up in, in the material world or in our uh, you know, in our buildings or in our education systems. Uh, how, so the question is, how can design contribute to changing the way people perceive the world? And do you believe that it's the gift of designers as storytellers to address this problem of perception and also as experts in connecting, um, connecting experts to be bridge builders? That was the question. Yeah, well, certainly there's a yeah, partial answer in that question. I absolutely, I think storytelling and narrative is a huge part of transition design. I think futuring is a huge, hugely important piece of transitioning our communities. I don't know if anyone is familiar with this book of Jonathan Poritz. We think it's, it's particularly nice because Jonathan Porritt wrote this from the perspective of a person living in 2050 and looking back on all of the milestones and the things that would have to change in order to get to a sustainable society. And so he took his vast knowledge gained over decades of working in the environmental movement and he wove it into this narrative that actually has things like um, timelines and uh, he talks about the water wars of a particular year. So we are storytelling animals. And I think one of the failures from my point of view of the environmental movement of the 60s was that it didn't have compelling narratives. And, and the, we should emphasize plural because one of the criticisms, of course, of the idea of vision and utopias is that a privileged, predominantly white set of people were always the ones specifying what that future should look like. And it was a future that was imposed. What we're talking about are emergent visions that come from within communities embedded in place. Yeah. And how can we develop compelling visions of a future we want to head toward and how can we keep them vibrant and constantly being updated? So I think that that too is a way to shift vision because I'll give you an example. When we ran our first uh, workshop in Ojai, we had different stakeholders coming together, and of course, not unusual to Ojai, any wicked problem. You get stakeholders from different groups, they can't even 
agree on what the problem is, let alone on how to go about solving it. But when we put them through an exercise to imagine what Ojai in 2050 would look like if the problems, their problems had been solved, we were amazed at how similar their visions were. They could agree on what their quality of life wanted to be like, how they wanted their children to be educated, what a vibrant community looked like. And I think we're in a time right now where we're so focused on our differences, we don't have good mechanisms for figuring out where we agree, because so often people actually agree on the big, the big quality of life things, as Fritjof said, the way we want to live our lives. So I think that these future spaces are important, narratives are important, and I think self-reflection is important too, because if we're not modeling the behavior that we want to see in the world, um, that's a huge problem as well. Terry, I'd, I'd like to add something to that. Um, uh, the, the changing perceptions can also be seen as transformative learning. Yes. And in my experience, uh, which I gathered from 20 years of teaching at Schumacher College and now also from the Capra course, uh, transformative, transformative learning takes place most effectively in a community, when yes. you have a learning community. So because in a community, you talk about networks of conceptual relationships, wicked problems, everything being interconnected. And at the same time, you experience the interconnections of human relationships in the community, especially those communities where people come from all over the world. Yeah. And so I wonder, I've, I've become more and more impressed by the importance of community in, yeah. in changing the world. And I, I wonder whether this fits into your framework of transition design, the notion of community. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one of the, I think one of the uh, most distinguishing features of transition design is that the design needs to be done by the community themselves. It's not about external consultants or experts coming in and designing for them. Uh, in this case, if a professional designer like me or Cheryl or Gideon is involved, we're simply creating spaces to let communities come together to figure out what they need, what they want, and we're identifying entrepreneurs within the community itself mm -hmm. to take the designs forward because it's simply not sustainable on these long-term projects for people outside the community that don't have a stake in its success, that aren't living there every day to do the work. So mm -hmm. part... Go ahead. The enzymes of transition design. Yes. So you're... Your facilitators, you're, you're maybe a catalyst, you're a neutral convener, but you are actually putting design uh, and continuity into the community. And actually what we're doing in Ojai is we are raising money, we are raising money to fund projects that will happen in Ojai. We're not asking them for money. Mm -hmm. And that turns the tables, I think that puts the community in charge of its, its own destiny. But I think part of the challenge too is to look for innovative fundraising opportunities in which maybe there are roles that are created within the community itself. So there are people paid to make sure that the projects and the interventions have that continuity over time. And this is a, an approach that Cheryl Dahl really pioneered in Future of Fish and that um, we're just now trying to launch in Ojai. So I'm just gonna jump in because we, we have uh, eight minutes until we need to fully wrap up. Um, and I don't know how long, Fritjof, you might want just to, to say some closing remarks. Do you think we have time for another question? No, no, I, I don't need to say closing <laughs> remarks. I'll let you do it, Phoebe. Okay, well um, then I'm gonna push it as, as long as yeah. I can and, and do a very speedy wrap up. Um, I've got two questions here, both of them are really interesting. One, I'm just gonna read them both so that 
yeah, you can be prepared to be able to answer both mm -hmm. at the time we have. So the first one is, has anyone written conclusively on ways uh, to counter, ch on ways counter challenges to transition design? Well, so has anybody written conclusively on examples of transition design in solving problems of congested mega cities of the developing world, such as Mumbai in India? Uh, if yes, please recommend some titles or names. So this is a question about, uh, yeah, you've, you've got the question. The second one is, I understand the need for development to be organic, but will such organic transition happen fast enough at the scale needed to avoid catastrophic change and collapse? So that one's more around the urgency of the time and, and the need to balance the yeah. Yeah, rightful organic pace versus the urgency. Well, I think the, the answer to the first one is not that I know of because transition design is only a few years old and we're just now trying to land some projects. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's not to say there aren't examples out there that you could probably say, oh yeah, that's a form of transition design. Yeah. Terry, one of them would be the work of Jaime Lerner in Brazil, in Curitiba. Oh yeah, when yeah, you should talk there. about that. Very successfully with urban congestion. Yeah. Could you say a yeah. little bit about it, Fritschoff? Uh, yeah. Uh, Jaime Lerner is a designer who was the mayor of the city of Curitiba in Brazil and then the governor of the state. And what he did was he designed a bus system which was modeled after a metro system, like the metro in, I don't know, the tube in London, the metro in Paris and so on. But it was buses. But the mm -hmm. innovation was that uh, people would wait in special shelters and buy their tickets beforehand and then all enter the bus in, in, in a space of, you know, of about 50 meters. They would all go in together and the buses were very long like a metro is and then they took off. He designed a special network uh, of these buses and he reduced car traffic by 40%. And he did a lot of other things in Curitiba. For instance, uh, they had a port which was very polluted. And he said to the fishermen, go and fish in the port. And whatever you pull out, I will pay you at the level of the price of fish. For if you give me, you know, uh, five kilos of junk, I will pay you for five kilos of fish. And within a very short time, the, the, the port was cleaned. And things like that, where he involved the community. Or for instance, he said to, there were lots of people living in the streets, kids living in the streets. And he said, um, help me clean up the streets. And for every kilo of garbage, I will give you a kilo of rice. Mm -hmm. And things like that, you know, yeah. that, that worked very, very well. Yeah, I think that's a great example of a multi-pronged systems approach. That's exactly what we're talking about. And certainly there's work to do in trying to collect stories like that. Uh, the second question about urgency, well, that is the question, isn't it? I mean, it's the question that we all have to ask ourselves, no matter what new approach you find, no matter what methodology you pursue, that question looms large over all of us all the time. Uh, and I, I always say to my students, I mean, I, I'm always very careful when I'm in front of our, our undergraduates in particular, I don't feel like it's ever fair for the older generation to just leave the younger one with this narrative of gloom and doom. We've got to find some hope. And I always take hope from chaos and complexity theory <laughs> that, you know, posits that phase transitions are possible. You know, you have a, you have a system and there's tiny little changes going on that are almost imperceptible. And all of a sudden the system can flip. I mean, Fritschoff's far more qualified to explain this than I am. But if enough of us are taking action, you know, these things can seemingly change out of nowhere. The fall of the Berlin Wall, I think, felt to many of us like, how the heck did that happen? Fritjof, you got something no, to say. Uh, Terry, Terry, recently I've, I've begun to, to explain it in the way by saying, in nonlinear systems, uh -huh. uh, individual small actions do not just add up. In linear systems, 
You need a lot of small actions to get something significant. Yeah. Or you need several big actions to get something significant. But in nonlinear systems, you have feedback loops. Yeah. And the feedback loops amplify this. So small actions plus communication in a network can lead yeah. to surprisingly uh, quick change and, and major uh, consequences. Yeah. See, for me, that gives me huge hope, coupled with the fact that we are, for the first time in humanity, completely interconnected in ways we didn't have even 10 years ago. The reason that transition design has gained interest is because we put everything up on academia.edu and social networks. And the ideas here today have reached how many countries? So if we're all working in these ways, I hold out hope for a phase transition myself. That's what keeps me getting up every morning. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a, a very appropriate and inspiring <laughs> conclusion. So, Phoebe, over to you for the wrap up. Yeah, that that was a. It feels like a good place to finish. So, thank you so much. Firstly, thank you, Terry. That was yeah, yeah super pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, really difficult to bring this conversation to an end, and I'm sure everybody's kind of hanging on to every every last word. Uh, and thank you for the work that you do. And um, yeah, thanks for sharing it with us. Uh, big thank you to everybody who's joined us today. And thank you for your questions. And also thanks to everyone who's been so helpful in posting relevant links and resources in the chat. Uh, I've been harvesting those and then we can share those on uh, the Vimeo recording. We can share it in the, um, the text part of the Vimeo recording and also send it out on our newsletter and our alumni network. So if you're not signed up to our newsletter, please uh, sign up via our website. Uh, and if you're not an alumni, then please consider joining uh, the fall 2018 uh, CAPRA course that starts on the 26th of September. Um, Terry, you've, you've taken part in the course, haven't you? I was the, on the beta, the beta group, I think. Oh, wow. There you go. Would, do you have any, any final kind of thoughts about the course or, or the parts that you really well, like? Well, I just think it's fantastic. I mean, we're redesigning our own DDES course right now and trying to figure out how we might um, in, integrate it into, into that. I just think it's a fantastic platform. And I just remember how important it was for me to be able to interact with Fritjof when I first started that all those years ago. And I think this is a stellar model. I, I encourage everybody to sign up for it. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and yeah, with that, I think we will close. And if anybody's got any feedback or suggestions on the format and the, the context of the webinar or any suggestions for guests that you'd like to see uh, next, please do just send us an email um, either at uh, capracoursepub at gmail.com or our, our admin email address. Um, yeah, so if you'd like to join our global cohort, please do so before the course fills up. And with that, I will close and uh, yeah, hope to see you on our next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for a chat. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you Bye, everyone. Thank you, Mira. <laughs> Cheers. See you next time. Bye.